Um, I want you guys to welcome Kenny Schmidt. Come on up here, Kenny. And uh, we're not allowed to introduce your wife, right? That's right. Okay, we're not allowed to do that, but she's standing, she's sitting right over here. All right. You, we can say, Kristen, you can wave. Kristen will wave, okay. She will not right. come up here. Okay. And, uh, and we also, I didn't know that, um, I didn't know that um, she was going to be here this morning, but uh, Alicia would. Alicia, would you stand? Uh, Alicia uh, works in the Middle East uh, specifically with, they do a camp for special needs kids uh, in the West Bank, and it's just an amazing thing. Um, the, the, you know, the analogy of salt and that um, what it's, the West Bank is 98% Muslim. That's right. And 2% Christian. 2% Christian. But this is what the Christians say. Um, we're like salt. It doesn't, you know, you think about a good steak, the mass of salt is not very high on a good steak. As a matter of fact, if it's 50% salt, you can't eat it, okay? Well, that's, that's, you got it country, in the that's in the country ham, you know, yeah. it's 50%, all right? But, but, um, but 2% salt changes a steak. And uh, that's what the Christians are. So, but, um, you know, just, she's just an amazing hero, um, works every day uh, amidst um, the conflict there. And, um, and I do want to just tell you guys, if you're watching online, and um, you must be really famous because we had like our biggest online numbers <laughs> oh, ever. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I know on a day. That tell, we them, sh- tell them you're turning it off. And yes. Then, yes. Gotta- yeah, once you say we're turning the feed off, then everybody jumps on. But we're going to turn the live feed off in about five minutes or so. But then we'll be back on in about 10 minutes and you can come back on. There's just some names, some stories that we just can't communicate. So who are you? (laughs) I'm Kenny. (laughs) My uh, connection to Grace uh, actually goes back to um, shortly after 9-11. I was a college student, a sophomore um, and I had some friends at the university where I was going, and they said, hey, there's this church. Uh, we're gonna go up to New York, and we're gonna just see what we can do and uh, help serve and that kind of thing, and lo and behold, those friends actually were connected to Grace Fellowship in Snellville. I had no idea. I met this bald guy, not this bald guy, but another bald no, guy. I, no, I had <laughs> hair then. <laughs> That's what Buddy Hoffman does to you, all right. That's right. <laughs> so... I'm distracted now. (laughs) Um, I've said that to him before, so it's okay, yeah. Um, But anyway, that fast forward a couple years, uh, Grace invited me to join staff, and so from 2004 to 2008, I was on staff in Snellville working with high school students. I was one of the basement dwellers, uh, if you've heard stories about that. Five years of my life was spent in Buddy and Jody's basement, and uh, Randy was my boss, and um, yeah, that's so we've been connected to Grace for a long time. So Kenny was the high school pastor, That's right. and uh, in, in a season that we were growing like crazy, we, we were doing like four services, and people were having to park at Horsetown and all kinds of stuff, yeah. and at the school and all this, and our youth group was huge. We were running 900 to 1,000 on Wednesday night. You had about 500 high schoolers. We were packing in the, the high school room. Uh, at Snellville is, is similar to this size, I guess, maybe. I think so, yeah. Uh, maybe a little smaller. Mm-hmm. And, and we couldn't keep the air conditioning down, so kids were passing out on Sunday morning. Uh, it, was, it was, I mean, just so many kids. And Kenny and I are on this balcony in Arequipa. Did I say that right? Arequipa. Yeah. Arequipa. And, and what country is Arequipa in? You it's know. in Peru, yeah. So um, <laughs> for context, we're, we're beautifully drinking coffee. It's this amazing there's this promenade courtyard out there, and we're, we're sitting up on this courtyard one morning before the kids were up, and we're drinking coffee. And I turned to you, and I said, Kenny, um, I don't think being the youth pastor is the best place for you. And you... Well, yeah, what do you do when your boss says that to you? <laughs> <laughs> and and he, I think you said, like, are you firing me right here? And I'm like, no, no. I, I think there's this other thing, because we, I mean, again, our youth group was huge. We had 200 lug heads, you know, half the, almost half the high schoolers were engaged in discipling middle schoolers. It was fun. Uh, we were, I think we had 60 kids in Peru with us on that trip, and uh, I mean, it was, it was this amazing, I mean, Holy Spirit stuff, Holy Spirit stuff, Holy yeah, Spirit stuff. that's strange. And, uh, and, but we, but God had this other thing. Yeah. 
And it, it was interesting just to kind of, from my perspective, right, are you firing me? It was, it was kind of a, how do I say it? There's a proverb, actually, uh, that says the, the enemy multiplies kisses, but the wounds of a friend can be trusted. And it, and it felt like a wound at the moment. But in a way, I, I felt like, I reflect on that. God was working and showing me and, and pulling me to the next uh, stage and, and phase in ministry. So maybe now we should switch the... Uh, yeah, we probably should goat. switch the feet off. Um, it's going to get more intense now. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so is the feet off?
you want to join our like uh, email updates and pray for us and pray for ministry things that are going on, you're more than welcome uh, to just shoot me a quick email and say, hey, I was at Grace New Hope and I'd love to be uh, on your list, sir. Okay, so now let's show you really quick. Um, I got a picture of the family. If, if We should have shown it earlier, but we haven't. Here's Kristen as soon as it comes up. And the kids. <sighs> there it is. Um, so that's Kristen. Uh, Lincoln is our oldest son. He's nine. Abigail is six. And Malcolm is three. Uh, this is us. Um, Lincoln wanted to be baptized. And so what better place than the Jordan River? Uh, he was born in uh, uh, Bethlehem, by the way. <laughs> and we're just like, just don't get crucified in Jerusalem. <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, so that's our three kids. And we're just delighted to be with you uh, today. Um, let's show the next picture. This is our neighborhood. Uh, all of these uh, houses, you kind of see the main road. This is a place called Abu Ghosh. Uh, but up on the hill is what I'm more interested in pointing out to you. This is called Kiryat Yerim. Now, uh, I want to know if any of you just instantly hear that word and can place it in the Bible. Anyone? Did you listen to Randy's sermon last week? Uh-oh. <laughs> anyway, I'm putting you on the spot here, but this is a place uh, in 1 Samuel, uh, and I'd like you to turn there, actually. Uh, Randy was speaking out of uh, 2 Samuel, and he was basically talking about Kiryat Yarim to Jerusalem. Okay, David took the ark, and he moved it uh, up there to Jerusalem. But my question is, how did it get there? But first, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 6, tw- verse 21. I've got it up here. And so uh, I'm going to read from here. I don't want to not face you. Here we go. And then they sent messengers to the people of Kiryat Yarim. That's where it was in the picture. That's where I showed you. Saying, the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your town. So the men of Kiryat Yarim came and took up the ark of the Lord. They brought it to uh, Abinadab's house on the hill, which let's take a little break. Uh, there's like an excavation where they think they found Abinadab's house, which is kind of cool. It's just like a kilometer from our uh, home, and consecrated Eleazar, his son. Now, a little bonus here. Eleazar means uh, like with God's help or by God's help, right? So El is, is, is short for God, and so Azar means to help, right? So if you have the, the name of God, El Roy, the God who sees, or El Shaddai, the God who is strong or mighty, this is Eleazar, so the God who helps. So they named his son um, this to guard the ark of the Lord, the ark remained at Kiryat Yarim a long time, 20 years in all, okay? So now, I'm not just interested in telling you like, oh, here's a nice, you know, historical, geographic, biblical fact. I want to use this as the launching pad for saying, how did the ark get there? Why is it there? And so what we got to do in order to unpack that is we got to read the Bible backwards, okay? So we're going to do a Look back at chapter (laughs) 6. Excuse me. The title is The Ark Returned to Israel. Okay, so the Philistines had it. Okay, that's important. And they didn't like having it. um, And so they basically sent it away. And so they sent it away to Beit Beit Shemesh. And they they basically put it on a cart and got a couple cows to lead it out. And the Israelites went and picked it up and they got it back. And so that's kind of the big idea in chapter 6. Now, the Philistines had it. Who were these people? Let me, can I get on a soapbox for a second? Palestinians are not Philistines, okay? They, they got it bad with their name. I recognize Philistine, Palestine. You, you can almost like get them messed up. These are a separate people. Philistines are gone. They're like not here with us anymore. Uh, and Palestinians are a different people. And so sometimes it bothers me when people say, uh, not, I mean, they're well-intended. They'll say to me, and, oh, you live in Jerusalem. Oh, they've been fighting for 3,000 years, those Philistines and Israelis. And I just kindly say, no, they haven't. They've actually been fighting for about 100, 120 years, okay? The conflict is not eternal, and it is not Israel fighting the Philistines, okay? Palestinians are a separate people group. So um, anyway, those are the Philistines. Now, let's go back another chapter to chapter 5. The title in my Bible is The Ark in Ashdod and Ekron. These are two Palestinian cities. They're down kind of by the coast. In fact, uh, Gaza is another one of these Palestinian cities. And so this is where the Ark is. And uh, 
so the, the, the Philistines have it. They stick it in the temple of Dagon, and what happens to Dagon? Falls on his face, right? They set it back up. Next morning, come down, boom, he's fallen on his face. His head is broken off. His hands are broken off, and people start breaking out in tumors. They're like, what is this? Who is this God? What is this power? They're like, so they start passing it around between the different uh, cities, Ashdod and Ekron and so forth. And so the question still remains, why did the Philistines have it to begin with? And this is where I want to park and actually look at some of the text here. So let's look at 1 Samuel 4. Okay. Verse 1. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at uh, Ebenezer um, and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. Not a good day for Israel. They just lost 4,000 men, and they got whipped. Then the soldiers returned to, the camp, turned to camp. The elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat on us the day before the Philistines? Now, so the elders, I, I think elders should ask the question, why? That's a good question for elders to ask. So they're like, uh, why did this happen? Let's keep going. Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh, that's where it belonged, so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Let's keep going. So the people uh, sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Okay. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Can you imagine? <sighs> Shouting so loud that ground shakes. Hearing the uproar of the Philistines, I'm in verse 6, uh, asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. Oh, no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. They knew their Bible story. They were afraid. They know what can happen when you cross God. Verse 9, be strong, Philistines. Can you hear him saying it? Can you hear the battle commander? Be strong. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews. So they, have, so they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. They went from losing 4,000 to 30,000. That's too, that's a bad day and then a really bad day. How did it happen? I think the secret, or it's not a secret actually, I think the key is in verse three. Let's look at this again. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Again, fair question for elders to ask, Right? Then what did they say? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh, etc. What did they not do? They didn't ask God. Can you imagine? They're like, well, uh, why did this happen? <gasps> that dude sat up in the elder meeting. He's like, I got an idea. Let's get God, and we're going to bring him out in front, and we're going to make God our weapon. I mean, he might not have said it that way. Can you imagine? They basically decided to march God out in front of their cause. It was a good cause, right? They make God a weapon, but God is not your weapon. He will be worshiped. That's the appropriate way this relationship's worth, work. God is not your weapon. He will be worshiped. Now, where I live, people are eager to recruit us to different causes, right? There's a lot of grievances out there. Hey, you want to free Palestine? You want to return all the Jews to Israel, right? You want to end Israel's military occupation? Maybe you want to help build the third temple. 
right? Any number of these things are causes. They're all around. And underneath so many of these, so much recruitment and these causes is a push for you to pick a side, right? Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's not. Free Palestine or bless Israel. It's framed as this kind of either or scenario. And I'll be honest, both sides, they march God out for their cause, don't they? They say, you're gonna be on God's side if you're freeing Palestine. You're gonna be on God's side if you're bringing Jews back to Israel, right? So, they use God to tell you that you should get involved. And I know that happens here too, right? Don't they? You know this, right? We could talk about racial stuff. We could talk about gender stuff. We could talk about economic stuff. We can talk about justice stuff, whatever it is. And, and people march God out for their cause, don't they? And I'm, I'm not here to tell you this morning what cause to pick or what you should or shouldn't do. That's not the point of the sermon. It's not whether Israel, Palestine, whatever. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to remind you of this story from Israel's history. This is a cautionary tale, right? They learned the hard way so that hopefully we don't. So what good cause do you support? And did you take time first to ask God whether or not to get involved? Just think on that. Of course, there's godly wisdom, there's counsel, there's scriptures, that's all a part of it, and God reveals his guidance in many ways. But have you sought the Lord? And by, by the way, I'm not another white guy telling you you need to keep the status quo. That's not what I'm doing here. Because if God speaks to you about something, you better do it. Okay? Resistance, conflict, whatever. The Lord speaks to you, go. Right? But do not march God out for your cause. Consult God. God will be worshipped. Worship God. He'll guide you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, here's a quick personal story to kind of flesh this out in real life. We had a mentor um, a few years ago. She'd been living in um, the West Bank for about 15 years. And she said, yeah, and in her 15 years, there had been multiple wars. Um, and she basically said, whenever I adopt the grievances of one people over another, I lose my anointing. Okay? So whenever you adopt the grievances of one people over another, you frame it as this either or kind of thing you're in danger of losing your anointing. So in other words, when you take on this group's anger, you take on their rage, or you take on their condescension, whatever ungodly attribute it may be, you're in danger of losing your anointing. Okay? Jesus is the one who can bear those burdens. He knows what to do with grievances. Right? That's his job. Okay, so the Ark of the Covenant... This is like a, a kind of a negative story. It's this cautionary tale of what not to do. Let's see if we can, I want to shift a little bit and take a more uh, positive one and see what do you do when you've blown it, right? Because the Israelites, they went and lost 4,000 men. We want to not lose 30,000, okay? And what I want to do is I want to turn to the Psalms of Ascent, okay? And I want to turn to Psalm 130, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, flesh it out, and then we'll wrap up. But what I thought would be nice is actually, can we read Psalm 130 together out loud? It's just so good. And let me set up one more thing so you have it in your mind. Um, Psalm 130 is, uh, the first line in it is a song of ascents. And that basically is a reference to the fact that this psalm was sung by Israelites three times a year on the way to Jerusalem, pilgrimage to Jerusalem, okay? So actually the Psalms, Psalm 120 to 134 are all Psalms that get read in this journey. So now imagine yourself on that journey and let's read it out loud together. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word, I put my hope. 
I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Now, here's the first thing I have to say about this psalm. Uh, memorize it. Memorize it. Uh, this, this will be far more useful to you in your walk with God than listening to the next 15 minutes of this sermon. God will work on you and your heart as you uh, memorize it and commit it to memory. And that's actually uh, just by circumstance. I, I committed it to memory four or five months ago, and the Lord has just been teaching me so many important things from this psalm, and I want to share just a couple of them with you to give you a taste. So let's look at verse one and two. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Why is the author crying for mercy? Now, think about the setting again. Here are all these families going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Have you ever gone on a road trip with three little kids? <laughs> Some people are like, no, no. <laughs> but yes, right? Sometimes you gotta cry out for mercy on these trips, right? Amen. Amen. We, were in, um, we went to Disney World, kind of an American sort of pilgrimage, and um, we were going back and we had to go to Iowa so our flights went to Chicago. We had left the car there. We were going to drive back um, those three hours. Um, but we thought we were going to get in at about 8 p.m. And then, you know, long story short, we get in at about 2 a.m. And we're like, we cannot go any further. So basically what we did is we just found the quickest hotel and we just collapsed into the beds, okay? And then we're sleeping and just completely dead to the world. There's a knock on the door. And Kristen goes, Kenny, did you hear that? I'm like, no, I'm sleeping. She says, Someone, someone, someone's knocking on the door. Like, okay, go check. What's like I'm sleeping. And so she gets up, opens the door, and there's a woman outside, outside, and she said, Is this your daughter? Oh, no. And she looks down and it's Abigail, four years old. And Chris is like, Come on in, baby. Yeah, why? What did you why did you leave? And like, I wanted breakfast. <laughs> We're like, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy, right? I mean, let me say, we are good parents. <laughs> we now lock the door. We put the sofa in front, maybe stack a suitcase, maybe two. Abigail does not escape anymore. <laughs> but the answer to this question, why would, the Lord, why would the author cry for mercy? It doesn't become clear until the next verse. Here's why. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? Why are they crying for mercy? Because they've sinned. They're, they feel guilty. They know they've blown it. Have you blown it? They know they've made a mistake, right? And let me just say, even though that child, they might, you know, you're on the family road trip again. Even though they might have acted selfishly or rude or ungrateful or mean or whatever they're doing, that does not justify the bad things that come out of you, right? I hear the dad saying amen. That's true. God is not, uh, let's come back. If you, Lord, kept a record of sin, Lord, who could stay? Who could stand? God is not Santa Claus. Can I get an amen? amen. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. God is not Santa. He does not keep a list. He keeps no record of sin. Isn't that amazing? And by the way, what's the answer to the question? If you, Lord, kept a record of sin, who could stand? No one. Isn't that great news? No, wait, no, hang on. It's actually great news because God is not judging us according to our perceived goodness, right? However good or nice we think we are, we, we can't cut it. We haven't cut it. You know, parents keep lists, right? If you do that one more time, right? Does your spouse keep a list? Does your friends keep a list? Or maybe more important, closer to home, do you keep a list? God does not keep a list. 
but with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. Amen, right? This is why I want you to memorize it. If you, Lord, kept a record of sin, Lord, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. It's like the whole psalm is wrapped up in that, those two lines. So not only does God show you mercy, he shows forgiveness. I remember I grew up in a church. I didn't grow up in grace. Um, I'm not gonna say the name of my church, but I grew up in a church that was very good at telling me how sinful I was. You know those churches? You're a sinner. Ooh, you're a bad sinner. But that's half the gospel, right? The other half is through Jesus, we're a saint, right? We are righteousness. He has imputed his righteousness to us. You can talk to Randy about how, like, how that all works in the theology. It's amazing, right? You're pure, spotless, without blemish, defect, or deficit. And what I love even about this little verse is that fact is hiding inside of it. If, if you, Lord, kept a record of sin, Lord, who could stand? What's the idea that's underneath? That through God, through his mercy, through his forgiveness, through Jesus, we can stand in God's presence. He lifts up those who are bowed down. I mean, just imagine the pilgrimage thing. You're, you've like gone, you've reached the end of yourself. You have been humbled. And you get to the end and God says, stand up. Isn't that good news? How do you access the mercy? How do you access the forgiveness? I wait for the Lord. My, my whole being waits, and in his word, I put my hope. Now, at this point, the author shifts. This is something it took me a few months to realize. In the first few verses, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ear be attentive to my cry for mercy. Who's he talking to? To God, right? Right? There's a shift here. He starts talking to himself. And if you're gonna talk to you and yourself about your sin, here's what I suggest. Use these words. I think there's a lot of people that talk to themselves about their sin and they just end up spiraling into some other craziness. They go deeper in sin because they're trying to like work it out that way. Use these words to talk to God about your sin. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits and in his word I put my hope. Is God slow? Is that why we gotta wait on him? In the first service, some people are like, no, yes, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a good thing to consider. Is God slow? Is he dragging his feet? Is, is he got his little, you know, looking at the list? He doesn't have a list. I can't even use that example, Right? <laughs> He can't say, oh, here, he could just wait just a little bit longer, see how long that, he doesn't, know. Okay, now, where I live, making someone wait is an expression of power, okay? You ever thought about this? You gotta get something done in some sort of bureaucracy, and the person on the other side says, can you wait a minute? And they're gonna go over there, and they're gonna do their thing with their computer, they're gonna go back and take a coffee break, they're just gonna walk around, look around, and just be, you know, make you wait, because they're expressing their power over you. That happens all the time where I live. Um, this happens, by the way, at checkpoints. There are lots of checkpoints in uh, uh, Palestine specifically, and Israeli soldiers make Palestinians wait. I'm, I'm just telling you the truth, okay? They wait a lot. And it's really tempting to curse uh, in those times. I could tell you stories about learning to bless and not curse. Uh, you remember that, uh, adopting the grievances of your people? Uh, I also think about it in adopting the curses of the people, right? There's some places that I uh, had cursed quite a bit, actually. But the, through Kristen, through our team, we said, what if we started blessing those places? Um, another thing that helps me with this is that, do you know who Aaron Keyes is? Yeah, I've known Aaron for, gosh, 25, maybe more years. He has a song, Sovereign Over Us, right? You are working and are waiting. Do you know that line? If you don't, oh, find this song, download it. You are working and are waiting. But the thing with God, it's not just that he's over there working and are waiting, trying to get done something done for you or done for me. God isn't behind the desk saying, hold a minute, 
I'll get back, I'll look into that. God doesn't tell me to take a number because he's working on other things. God tells me to take a number because he's working on me. God doesn't tell you to take a number because he's working on other things. God tells you to take a number because he's working on you. Are you gonna let him? I have a, a, a Palestinian friend, Muslim background. We had all these conversations about Jesus, all the rest of it. You know how it goes. One day he came to me and he said, you know, I was at the checkpoint the other day and I just felt the spirit of God coming in, teaching me patient. I was like, you're almost there, man. <laughs> right? When the spirit of God starts showing up to you in those times, when you're tempted to curse, when you're tempted to walk away, right? You, and by the way, with this song, you are working and are waiting, there's more than just that catchy line, sanctifying us, when beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust, you're teaching us to trust, that's what God is up to. That's what he's doing. Will you let him? <clears throat> I wait for the Lord more than watchmen, wait for the morning, more than watchmen, wait for the morning. Why does the psalmist say it twice? You ever thought, think about that? By the way, in Hebrew, it's only two words, shomrim uh, habokel, and uh, that means uh, waiting, yeah, right, more than watchmen waiting for the morning. Now, why do they wait for the morning? It's not because they're like in this sort of graveyard shift, rent a cop type situation. They're waiting on the Lord because they've been trust, entrusted to care for the most important thing. I think you gotta say the phrase twice because it's tempting to give up in the night, isn't it? Have you ever been tempted to abandon the most important thing in the dead of the night? Have you ever been tempted to give up the wait when you're sitting in the dark? when God hasn't made it clear yet, when the way hasn't been opened. I think that's why you gotta say it twice. It takes a double dose of vigilant. Vi say that word for me, vigilance. All right. Um, think about, back to Kiryat uh, um Eleazar, the guy who watched the Ark of the Covenant for 20 years. I think he understood what it meant to guard the most important thing, right? It had gone down the hill, it had gone into the land and in the, in the, in the, among the Philistines. He was entrusted to guard the most important thing. Here's another way to say it. Um, think about getting our mind around this idea of watchmen waiting for the morning. What time of day are you most likely to sin? Ever thought about that? It hadn't occurred to me until meditating on this psalm. What time of day are you most likely to sin? It's at the night, right? It's not after you've had your quiet time. It's not after you've had your coffee. It's, it, you know, things don't go well about 4.30 around my house, 4.30 to 7 in bedtime. Ooh, I'm having to say, you are working and I'm <laughs> we, Those are the good days, by the way. <clears throat> now, let's see. What would have happened that day if Israel had had the bad day, the 4,000 people dead bad day, and instead of going and saying why and coming up with a cool idea to weaponize God, what if they had gone back and said, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. In his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. What if that had been their, what they said to one another and to themselves that day? What happens next? No, I'll read this last passage, tell you a story, and we're done. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. So this is the third shift, right? We started talking to God, then the author started to, to talking to themselves, and now they're talking to the community, <laughs> Israel, right? Put your hope in in the Lord. Um, we got a call uh, a couple weeks ago from one of Kristen's friends uh, who lives in a country that's close to ours. Um, 
And it was a report that this friend had actually come to faith. And we were thrilled. Oh, my gosh. And then we started thinking, we had just seen her for the first time in five years just a couple months ago. We had gone to visit that country for the first time in, in eight years. And we arranged the thing. And Shelly, our friend, helped us with that. And um, Kristen just had such an amazing experience. It's like God has been working in this girl, this woman's life. She had been through lots of challenging stuff, okay? Uh, when she started going through that stuff, Kristen thought, I'm gonna put her in touch with some friends I know in this other country. And those friends got to know her and met her and began loving on her, and God began working in her life. Here's the beginning of that story. You know how that story began? We were waiting for visas in Gwinnett County. We're, we're twiddling our thumbs in Gwinnett County for seven months. Kristen goes into the grocery store, sees, sees a woman there. She's like, I want to talk to her. I know she speaks Arabic. She says, hi, I'm Kristen. What's your name? You know, kind of freaked her out. Then she asked in Arabic, and that really freaked her out. Uh, but here's the point. Kristen's words were, hey, I'm Kristen. But I think what was happening that day is she was really saying, put your hope in the Lord for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. That's what we're doing. The Lord, we experience his mercy, and the band can come up, by the way. Um, we experience his mercy. We, first off, we sin. We blow it. We totally mess up. We come in. We cry out for mercy. We wait on the Lord. We experience his mercy, and he sends us out to our community. And so I think the thing just to leave you with this morning is God is working in your waiting. God is working in your waiting. Amen. I think Randy's coming up too. Can we thank Kenny for this morning? Um, his, uh, can we, and can we put that email address up there again? I'm, and if... Um, you know, there are some churches are storehouse churches, and you they only want you to give through them. We're not a storehouse church. We do a lot missionally, but um, if you guys want to want to email, um, get connected to what they're doing. Um, pray for us too. Please, yeah. please pray. You know, this is a. Most of our children don't know what it's like to hear the sounds that his kids do. And they're sweet kids. Um, and uh, But they're not comfortable. You know, if you, we were singing that song this morning, we can get comfortable in our status quo. Um, but the father is not comfortable with Hindus going into eternity and not knowing who Jesus is, or Muslims going into eternity and not knowing who Jesus is, or Jews going into eternity and not till, knowing who Jesus is, or people from Georgia going into eternity and not knowing who Jesus is. Um, so we we did this first hour, but I but I want um, I wanted uh, you guys, uh, Kristen, Alicia, and Kenny, go over. Um, and to the nation's corner. And if some of you guys that feel led to pray for them want to go over and pray for them this morning, we want to pray for them. Um, but I also just want to challenge us in the place where we are, in our common everyday life in the grocery store. Um, what, what is God doing? Where is he moving us? And, and what, what kingdom are we most attached to? So, um, Jesus, I thank you for the Schmitz. I thank you for their life. I thank you that they have answered this call so clearly. Um, I'm going to interrupt my prayer. God is calling some people to be willing to go. God is calling some young people in this room to be willing to go. And 
look, we need you here. And, but Keith Green used to say this, there'll always be enough disobedient people here. We'll be all right. <laughs> God is calling some people that are willing to go. And this was not planned. There's a, man, there's a lot this morning that's not been planned. But that's just kind of how he does. Um, as we take communion this morning, this is, this is my challenge to you. If he is stirring your heart, I would be willing to step, to put career on hold, to change my trajectory, but I would be willing to go and do this call somewhere besides here. And I'm willing, and I don't know what it is, but you're willing, and you sense something, you're not sure exactly what it is yet, we want to journey with you in that. I, I'm just going to say, I want you to come down here and pray this morning. And I'm going to ask Kenny and Kristen and Alicia to pray with you this morning. So we're not going to pray for you over here. Okay. We're going to do this. All right, we'll change it up. And if nobody comes, then I'm not hearing from the Lord, okay? And the elders will deal with me later. Um, <laughs> But I believe God's, I believe God's stirring in some hearts this morning. And this, this kingdom call, this kingdom call, it doesn't get fixed by people playing church. It gets fixed when God's people seriously consider the call of God in their life. Amen. So we're going to sing. stand. We're going to do communion. We're going to sing. And we're going to pray. <laughs>